Yeah, so I think to the first part of that, I think the inflation is absolutely real. Uh, if anything, I think the headline numbers that we see uh, somewhat understate uh, the actual inflation, in large part because of the shelter component. So it's kind of a wonky uh, way for them to calculate it. Uh, and it somewhat understates and smooths out uh, changes in house prices it's compared to how it used to be calculated. And so I, I think, you know, the quote unquote real inflation is probably at least in the low double digits. So, you know, kind of a, a few hundred basis points higher than it is now. But of course, everyone has their own, uh, you know, individual uh, inflation basket because they all have their own, uh, you know, different things that they buy at a regular basis, the different weightings that they assign uh, in their daily life. So there's, there's no kind of one inflation metric, but I think if we were to have kind of a more consistent reading, we'd be, we'd be at a slightly higher figure. That being said, we are seeing uh, evidence of disinflation starting to materialize, meaning that, you know, inflation might be cresting and then kind of stabilizing, at least for a period of time. So you could get, you know, disinflation doesn't mean deflation. It just means less inflation, like less rate of change. And so, you know, the way I would describe it is that the supply side remains largely unresolved. Uh, We basically have have various supply side limitations, especially as it relates to energy and commodities. Um, But we also, there's the demand component. And by, you know, tightening up fiscal policy, just, you know, kind of in an intermediate way, and by tightening up monetary policy, they're basically taking some of the demand off. uh, But that essentially means a recession. Um, Another thing that I think people have to keep in mind is that the, the strategic petroleum reserve is still being drawn down um, and that, that's still expected to continue for uh, you know a little while longer. And so that's putting somewhat downward pressure on oil prices. So I think you know, right at the current time, I think we hit kind of a fever pitch in terms of inflation. Uh, and now that it's it's rolling over somewhat, uh, but I, I think that the problem is that it it's kind of like holding a beach ball underwater. It's ready to return as soon as they you know kind of let go uh, of some of those levers. Uh, and of course, there's other variables too. We have to see what happens out of China, right? Because China is a huge demand source for commodities and energy, and they're showing weak economic data as well. Uh, but obviously, the one spot where there's still huge inflation risk more than anywhere else is probably Europe, uh, because they they have the most severe supply side limitations. Um, but that, I think that's that's kind of where the data is pointing at the current time. I wanted to pick up on one thing you mentioned there, and that was the American Strategic Petroleum Reserves. It's been fairly controversial. Uh, not to have a reserve. <laughs> Our channel used to be called Reluctant Preppers, and we talk a lot about preparedness. So having a reserve, an emergency reserve, is what we're all about, and, and we encourage every household to be as well. So for a sovereign nation to have a reserve of any critical commodity uh, makes perfect sense. However, there's been some controversial information out there in the on the uh, internet and so on saying that U.S. is selling, drawing down its petroleum reserves, not just to uh, alleviate current consumer prices in the U.S., but to also send overseas. To, some people even say to, to build up China's stockpile. Um, it, it can turn into kind of trying to scratch your head to figure out what the authorities in your country, how this is serving the better needs of your people. Uh, although we know that there is a stated agenda of the current administration to make petroleum and fossil fuels in general less affordable and less desirable so that people rotate away, pivot into what are considered more sustainable, greener alternatives, et cetera. Um, do you have any particular insights into whether in fact some of these drawdown on the U.S. petroleum reserves are in fact going overseas and whether that in fact is part of a intentional uh, strategy of making fossil fuels less accessible to the U.S. so that people turn away from them to other sources? So I think that there's reasonable criticism that they're, you know, kind of drawing it down for political reasons, that it's not an actual crisis um, and that they're basically suppressing prices leading up to the election. Uh, I think that's a reasonable criticism, whereas, for example, what's happening in Europe is more of an actual crisis. You know, in in the United States, we have high energy prices. In Europe, they have crisis level energy prices. Um, The the other part, though, about selling it overseas, that one. Uh, I think is more straightforward in the sense that, you know, my understanding of, of the way that that uh, reserve works is they have, you know, when they choose to draw it down, they have to sell to the highest bidder. Uh, and it just so happens that some of these bids, China was the highest bidder. Uh, now, on one hand, you know, commodities in general, except for natural gas, because it's it's so um, the costs are so much in transportation, but certainly in oil, it's a relatively fungible market for the most part. Uh, and so if you're if you have demand anywhere in the world, that's going to trickle through uh, global prices. And so I, I still think that them 
selling to foreigners actually does put some downward pressure uh, on domestic prices as well um, because it's a fungible market. Now, that still could be a separate matter from whether it's a good idea to draw down the reserve or not. Uh, I, I think it's probably, you know, not. Uh, but I wouldn't put them as like the motive of, say, trying to trying to say just push down foreign prices. I also think if you look at polls, for example, you know, if, if you ask people what is the biggest concern facing them, inflation will be, you know, at the top. And then like high gasoline prices, which is another way of saying inflation is like, you know, number two or three. And then high rent prices, which is another way of saying inflation is also like, you know, two or three. And and so I, I think they have a legitimate interest in, in pushing down uh, energy prices in, in, to, in the intermediate term uh, because they generally want that to be reflected uh, in in how the vote goes. Uh, because if they, you know, if, if they go into the election with like $7 oil across the country, I think that's going to be a lot harder for them than if they go into the election with, you know, $3.50 oil, uh, a gasoline, for example. Um, so that, that's kind of how I'm analyzing that situation. How about the next part of the scenario of the official response from the Fed and others in the monetary world to say that they're trying to be firm in, in attacking uh, in, in their response to to uh, attacking inflation. Do you think that their response is actually meaningful and do you think it's going to have a meaningful effect or is it just window dressing because they can't really take stronger action because of the weakness of the economy, etc.? So I think they can take action around the margins. Uh, and I think we're seeing that show up in, in the housing market, for example, uh, how that impacts, uh, you know, mortgage rates and things like that. You know, this partially from private market forces and then partially from those kind of more central forces. Um, and I think, you know, basically they have a number of tools that kind of rein in demand uh and in their view they want to try to use them moderately uh but of course if you look at the historical track record uh you you know soft landings are rather rare uh in, in u.s you know uh, economic history right usually they tighten into a recession uh because they you know during the loosening phase they basically encourage uh debt accumulation and then they tighten the screws on anyone that, that actually took out debt uh, in that environment. And so I think we're I think we're seeing that play out now. We're seeing a cooling off in the housing market. Uh, you know, we're seeing some uh, softness in the labor force uh, around the margins, at least. So especially when you look at initial uh, jobless claims each week, uh, labor force participation, job openings. Uh, ever since March 2022, we've seen kind of a, a softening in there. And so I do think it'll be, quote unquote, effective around the margins for you know, temporarily rating in inflation, but I think it, it comes at the cost of either, a, you know, significant economic slowdown or an outright recession. Uh, and I think that that's kind of sort of the environment they're in now. You know, my kind of base case is that, you know, we, so we've had two quarters in a row of, uh, you know, negative real GDP growth. Uh, it's a little tricky because we, we came off such a sugar high. Uh, and so, for example, most recessions, not all, but most recessions, they also go, uh, you know, negative year of year real GDP. Uh, uh, we haven't we haven't hit that threshold yet. That's kind of like another arbitrary threshold. Uh, the the very mild 2000s recession actually didn't quite hit that either. Um, so, but like so far we have not kind of reached that threshold. Um, but I think that if this if this kind of trend continues, I think we we can kind of trend in that direction. And you could certainly have a kind of a, you know, like a double dip recession where you have say two negative quarters and then a slightly positive quarter and then another negative quarter and you can kind of like you know bounce along this weak path uh but so far the data is still deteriorating you know basically rate of change data is still showing overall kind of weakening prospects when you look at pmis when you look at uh you know pro like producer prices paid basically we're seeing a, a disinflationary impulse but not really for good reasons more so due to the demand destruction rather than uh you know the supply constraints easing 